All right, hello everybody. So um, I'm back with another room of my forums. It's going to be like kind of heavy on philosophy stuff, but let's see. Let's see if I can make this intelligible. If at any point something I'm saying sounds like what, what, what are you talking about, please stop me, and I'll I can explain a little bit more. Um, okay, so let's start here. What is enchantment? So like in order to understand like disenchantment, I will first explain a little bit about what people mean when they talk about uh, enchantment. So historians and social theorists and philosophers sometimes concern themselves with this question, right? How can we, how can we characterize at least some of the important cultural and spiritual differences between the world as it is now and the world as it was for most of post-agricultural human, or at least the very least Western history? I think people often have a sense that like, you know, modernity in our contemporary world is like fundamentally different from the sort of like traditionalism of the past. Um, and so, in order to give legs to that basic intuition, a lot of you know, academics have wondered, okay, what, is this, what does this mean? So one view that was originally put forth by Schiller and then later Max Weber um, is the view that the world is in, uh, disenchanted, which means like before humanity lived, it basically believed in all sorts of like magical creatures and forces. Um, that's like one way of putting it. Basically, like supernatural things were taken as real at least in, you know, uh, in a lot of contexts, uh, we just believed either in like spiritual forces like demonic possession and that sort of thing, uh, gods, uh, myths, that sort of uh, stuff had like real, uh, like cultural power to people. And we don't really have that to the same extent these days. Um, we know now because of science that most of the myths that we believed in in previous ages are not true. Um, most of the sort of mythological explanations for natural phenomenon, for stuff that happens in our everyday lives, isn't actually the case, or at least not on the scientific worldview that sort of is the backdrop to modernity, right? So it's disenchanted. So as a bit of contrast, like, uh, I'll ask you for a moment to just imagine like the world of like a medieval English peasant. I don't know, it's sort of easy to call to mind, I think. Um, so before the Reformation, before the Renaissance, and before the Enlightenment, either when they were, you know, at post-Christianized and Catholic Catholicized, or even before that, when they believed in, you know, whatever pagan gods that uh, the people who lived there before might have believed in. Um, so in this world, they were mostly unaware of like a lot of the structural mechanical forces behind things. Something like how a tree grew, how crops grew, why weather was the way that it was, why people fell ill and other people didn't. All of that was not really understood to the same degree that we now understand it. They weren't totally as ignorant as like popular media might portray, but they didn't really have a sense for what we now call philosophical naturalism, which is again this sort of dominant view that stuff just happens for natural describable mechanical reasons. It's not, the sun doesn't rise for any sort of mythic purpose. It just, it doesn't even rise at all, actually. It's just that the earth turns toward it. And there's nothing like, deeper happening there, right? But for people in pre-modern times, before any sort of, you know, advanced astronomy that we could learn that about, uh, learn about, like, the earth revolving around the sun through, uh, they didn't know that. So there was a lot of, like, mythic importance ascribed to these things. Um, this is really important to this. Like these myths, too, the myths that structured a lot of the explanations for you know natural phenomenon and social stuff, uh, were also deeply part of meaning making in the culture. So now the fact that the sun rises every day and we know that it's just because the earth turns toward it, right? That doesn't really mean that much to us. We can kind of like take a moment, be mindful and appreciative of it or whatever, but that's not the same thing as having a sort of like myth about a sun god and the like majesty of the sun god returning every day, being a part of your shared cultural world. And again, not just in this way where it's like, oh, like, you know, that's kind of a nice little story. Like, no, that's what it was. That's what they believed earnestly was the case. And then that also structured the way that they interact with each other for all sorts of different, you know, this is true across many different uh, cultural religious groups, right? So that, that's kind of what's meant by enchantment. Is this, like, you feeling it, you know? And, you know? There's like a really palpable difference there. So disenchantment, right, is then the process by which modernity, like driven by rationalization and scientific advancement, but also like economic uh, changes in the world, strips the world of those mythic qualities. 
So in the disenchanted world, phenomena previously attributed to supernatural forces are explained rationally and scientifically, right? They make the world predictable, controllable, and bureaucratic. Rather than having to do a sacrifice or pray that the sun is going to return, you can kind of just, well, you know, do some meteorology and figure that out, right? Do some statistics, figure out when the good growing season is going to be in this really ultimately bureaucratic kind of way. This shift has led to secular and systemic society, right, where traditional religious and metaphysical beliefs lose a lot of their influence, um, resulting in a more orderly, less spiritually, like, meaningful existence. A lot of times, this is like a good thing, right? For, for plenty of reasons, like we don't have like witch burnings and all that kind of stuff anymore. We don't do human sacrifice or animals. Well, sort of don't do like ritual animal sacrifice. Um, but uh, you know, there's plenty of, of things that are lost in this transition too, which is the sort of like interpersonal significance that comes from living in a world where your myths penetrate you and the world. So all of that. The, the loss of those spiritual qualities essential to the world uh, kind of takes away some of the processes of meaning making. And scientific bureaucracy is not really a good substitute for that, as it turns out. Mostly because, actually I forgot to put this in a note here, but then I remembered I had to say it. Like, the myths, a lot of times, that we you know, tell about the world, about like, why, you know, why do we have fire, it's because, like, um, what's his name, stole it. Um, I mean, still, you know, like, yeah. This uh, this has like a sort of intuitive understanding that reflects the moral psychological world that we live in. But the story about like I don't know, humans evolved in a certain way to like you know manipulate wood to make fire or something doesn't have quite the same like myth psychological resonance for us. And so that's why like the scientific explanations for things and understanding things in this basically philosophical naturalist way are a poor substitute for the like more rich, rich mythic world that humans used to inhabit. So one of the most prominent writers about this, or one of the most well-known writers about this, is Charles Taylor, who I like knew about vaguely in college because this guy who I was friends with, who was a Christian, was really into him, and I was not a Christian at the time. So I was like, okay, whatever, like, I don't know about that. <laughs> but then I recently, in the past like two years, uh, got this book and have kind of read parts of it. It's really good. Charles Taylor, he's, he's Catholic, so the people who are, I'm going to be talking about mostly in here are, uh, they are Christian, they're both Catholic. Um, so he characterizes like, the, like sort of like basic like, me like mechanisms of disenchantment in this way. In a uh, in pre-modern traditional societies, he describes people as basically like porous, which is a funny kind of gross word for it. I don't really like that, but whatever, it, it works. Um, individuals right, experience themselves as deeply embedded within like a world of spirits and gods and cosmic forces. They, like I was saying before, you are a part of this world which is mythic. Your existence, you know, like you might truly believe you were descended from Adam and Eve, like in the most literal sense, and that sort of myth history for your own existence permeates your existence in this world. The boundaries between the self and the outside world are permeable. Spiritual and supernatural entities abound, and one sense of identity and agency is intertwined with them, right? This, the openness leads to a sense of vulnerability to demonic possession or the will of the gods, but it also leads to kind of interconnected experience of reality, because we're all living the same story together, if we're in the same culture, probably, right? Like, we're all, you know, doing Aztec sacrifices, we're all doing early Christian worship. All of these things permeate the world in our community, make us vulnerable to each other as well. In contrast, Taylor describes modern selves, like modern individuals, as buffered in a way. We see ourselves having clear and impermeable boundaries that separate ourselves from the external world. This buffered self is autonomous, right? We, sh we believe that we're all free, acting individuals, rational agents in a market, like, um, and like you know, we're, we have control and self-sufficiency over that. Uh, but it leads to feelings of is uh, like isolation and disconnection from a broader, more meaningful order. Because again, if we look for that broader order, I think this is like an intuition a lot of people have. If you look for a more broad, you know, order of the world, it turns into this very mechanistic, naturalistic thing that we are, you know, that we understand to be the case because we live in this post-scientific world. Another author 
who I, wait, actually before I move on, anybody got any questions? Any clarifying questions or anything? Am I being, am I being quite plain? Yeah, okay. All right, so another author who I really like, who I discovered through a Catholic friend of mine, is this guy, Eugene McCarraher, he's so cool. So he's a Catholic Marxist historian. Um, and he also takes up the analysis of disenchantment. But he has a sort of different, he has an alternative view of this. Rather than this sort of uh, like standard received view in this domain of scholarship where it's like we used to look at magic and now we don't kind of thing, he thinks that we actually are still enchanted. But he thinks that what's happened in modernity is not a loss of enchantment, right, but a redirection or perversion of it, which he calls misenchantment. So he thinks that in capitalist modernity, and because he's a Marxist, obviously, right, capitalism is going to be really important to this analysis. Um, it hasn't so much eradicated like that natural need for humans to like live in an enchanted, like narratively rich, mythically rich world, but it's rechanneled into new forms, particularly those that are structured by capitalism, right? Um, it results in stuff like consumerism and uh, worship of the market. The book is like massive, actually both of these books are massive, and most of this one is just like kind of telling the history of how this happened, because, well not because he's Catholic, that was about to be slanderous, but he does partly point to the Protestant Reformation as having a big part in this, um, in kind of desacralizing Christianity. Of course, as Episcopalians, we still got sacraments, so it's not quite the same, but a lot of Protestants don't have sacraments, and he thinks sacraments in the Catholic sense were really were the kind of like myth by which people in Christendom and so by stripping away the sacraments as an important part of the theology, we lose that kind of uh, mythic enchantment. Capitalist religion as a sort of outgrowth of like, you know, something like Calvinist Protestantism um, is filled with all sorts of new rituals and sacraments, though. It's not that we've lost sacraments entirely, it's that they're new. Um, and new rituals and sacraments and deities. This misenchantment means that the spiritual capacity, right, that one found, once found its expression in traditional faiths or religious rituals and that sort of thing, is diverted into the pursuit of wealth and the veneration of the market. So capitalist institutions and commodities take on a sacred character. And, you know, there's like a, when I first encountered this view, I was like, okay, like on the one hand, like on first blush, this looks like the kind of thing that's like, I don't know, you get, you get like high with your buddies in your dorm room, like, whoa, like, what if capitalism is a religion? It's like, whoa, that's, okay, that's sick. But if you think about it, it's actually so true. <laughs> um, we really do have a kind of uh, sacred experience. In, not in the way that we associate because we're Christians, we go to church, you know, that's its own kind of sacred experience. But people in general have a very pious sort of attitude towards features of market capitalism. Some easy examples that come to mind, right, are like the market or the economy are referred to in explicitly like anthropomorphic but deified terms, right? I think they talk about, the way that they talk about like the economy in the news or the presidential debates or anything like that is honestly, if you think about what it is, kind of ridiculous. Um, consumer activity or just like the activity of people buying stuff at scale, right, is uh, like, referred to again as this kind of acting thing, like the economy's doing this, the economy's doing that. Things can be good for the economy, right? And sometimes things have to be sacrificed for the good of the economy. I think this was a pretty big uh, like talking point toward the end of COVID, or actually even in the height of it, when people were talking about like, okay, we need to, I don't know, throw uh, poor people into the maw of the economy in COVID, you know, to get this thing going again, right? Like that was, that was something that was sincerely and earnestly talked about. Superstitious measures of human value, right, like credit scores. Give, think of, like, credit scores are crazy. Credit scores, I think, are kind of blasphemous, in my opinion. Like, that is, you know, a measure of somebody's worth, in, in some sense, right? Only a part of their worth, but not really, right? When you think about it from this level of the system, it's a huge measure of how much they are of value to the economy god. Um, and they weigh heavily in social relations and self-conception, your net worth, your social class as signified partly by the amount of capital that you command. All of those things are incredibly important to the way that we understand ourselves and each other. You see a homeless person walking outside and you immediately understand subconsciously, and often we have to fight against it, that person is of another caste. They are, they like in some sacred way don't belong to this group of, you know, 
wealthy Episcopalian or something, right? And that is, that is really essential to the way that we conceive of ourselves and each other in this post, uh, well, this misenchanted world. Smaller scale ones abound um, the idolization of particular commodities and lifestyles, right? I think of like techno optimism. When you, the way that some of these guys talk about AI is totally like, oh man, you should have just been a Christian. Like, what are you doing? Like, don't, you know, like, you clearly want, you're clearly like yearning for the second coming, but what you're doing is talking about like the ChatGPT Wikipedia rephraser app becoming sentient or something, right? Like, no. Um, and like new age and wellness marketing stuff, all of this kind of fills a void that has opened up by kind of like de-Christianization de of society. Um, celebrity worship is an interesting one too. Uh, people have like rapturous experiences at Beatles or Taylor Swift concerts, right? And this is kind of a similar sort of thing. Okay, so actually let me, I keep forgetting to pause. Any, got any questions? Am I, yeah, still being clear, still on track, okay. Okay, so what if you still believe in God, which is kind of like, a, right, I mean, we're in a church. Um, people still believe in supernatural entities and forces. All of that is still a part of many people's lives. Um, that's a picture of Lakewood Church, the uh, uh, Joel Osteen uh, mega church. Um, but Christianity itself has arguably been affected by misenchantment, too. First, in the way that I mentioned before, where a lot of Protestantism is kind of like post-sacramental in a way that takes away a lot of the sort of like magic and ritual that was essential to Catholicism. Um, but another, the most obvious example to me is prosperity gospel theology, which I'm sure you're all familiar with. It's sort of, in a way, a foil to our own practice here as a really dominant form of American Christianity, um, which basically holds that God rewards his faithful with material wealth, right? And this is a way of kind of like taking like the, the, the shape and the, the trimmings and the, the sort of aesthetics of Christianity and then shoving it into capitalist misenchantment, right? It's like a sort of like, I don't know, I, I sometimes, I don't know why I do this to myself, but I'll watch, you know, this kind of mega church stuff just to see what do they got going on over there, right? And like, it really is clearly like, okay, they took like, you know, I mean, it, there's, some, there's some Christian stuff going on there, but a lot of it is in service of this kind of like, Misenchanted wealth uh, worship. Okay, but apart from those extreme cases, right, we still live in a society, and it's impossible not to at least be partly affected by the forms of meaning making and significance, those narrative forms of meaning making and significance offered to us by the culture we comprise. That includes a basically scientific worldview and a basically capitalist value structure. Like, nobody here, even as, as devout as many of us might be, Nobody here gets sick and earnestly thinks, probably, like, okay, a demon has done this to me. Usually not, right? Like, usually we don't literally blame demons for, you know, getting a flu or getting cancer or something like that. Um, and probably everybody here worries about their credit score and worries about, you know, their interest rates and worries about those other things that are sort of, you know, markers of their wealth position in society. Okay, so that, you know, even in spite of being Christian, we still live in this world which as a whole has been dis or misenchanted. Um, okay. Okay, so this is the part where I start to go, oh man, okay, what do I want to do here? So um, what role then do, does Christianity have? And I think it's really important. Like, Part of my like faith journey has very much been in reaction to what I perceive to be a misenchanted society, trying to like find alternative methods of meaning making. One naive view that, one, that some people do is, I guess you could try to simply return to a world of enchantment. I think some people want this, right? I guess maybe you could argue that like uh, Christian nationalists want something like this. They see this world, they look outside, it's scary because like gravity is happening and like evolution and stuff. And they go, we need, we need to have like you know a, a theocracy. Um, but I don't think that's going to work, right? The genie is out of the bottle, so to speak, and we also know he does not exist. Got there, just mean, you know, the, the magic of, of genies and stuff isn't really real. Um, and so we probably don't want to reject a basically scientific worldview. I think we have a lot of doctors in this congregation, they certainly can't do that. Um, so, what options does that leave us with? Well, in my view, I think Christianity and a lot of faith, a lot of faith traditions for that matter, can provide lenses for critique of dominant forms of value and just an alternative for the individual. That is, while capitalist ideology, or misenchantment, if you like, might uphold certain values, like credit scores, for example, the Christian faith provides us with an alternative set 
of values and, and better ones, in my opinion, right? Forgiveness of sins and debts, for example. Uh, our communities exist to practice and uphold those values. So again, while it's really easy for us to see, like the, what, like, from the point of view of like, I don't know, of the religion that built that skyscraper next to us, right? You know, like that sort of like uh, property manager developer religion. Like the homeless people outside are a disgusting inconvenience that should be, you know, swept away and gotten rid of, right? The fact that it just became legal for uh, states to do that. But we understand, you know, because of our alternative value structure, like no, the Bible and Christianity teaches us that these are people who are just as worthy of love as we are, no matter their debts and no matter where they find themselves in society. That sort of that is the the sort of like uh, alternative position that I think Christianity can offer us. Um, like, and I think actually, in a certain sense, like most churches kind of tacitly do understand this. Um, even like fundamentalist evangelical pastors will say stuff like, the world's going to tell you X, but we know that from scripture that Y, you know, usually they're going to be like, it's about gay marriage or other things that it's silly to be mad at, but like, they will, you know, I see this stuff all the time, I get suggested all kinds of like Instagram content from like fundamentalist people, right, and they're always saying like, yeah, you're going to hear from the world that you should do this, but we know from scripture that, right, that structure is actually, I think, kind of okay, like, they're, they're on to like the basics of it, right? Which is that there are plenty of parts about modernity that are damaging to people. They just misidentify what those are. Um, they go wrong, right, because their theology is kind of bad, um, but uh, it doesn't have to go wrong. Um, I think that Christians understand that our own value and others, uh, that of others comes from God. In, uh, in church, in the Eucharist, right, a form of love is revealed to us, and one that can teach us about value that transcends market value or other forms of value that sort of arise in disenchantment. And I think that's that's really important, right? Like that is that is I think what where where faith practice has like a response to um, you know like what's given to us from like I don't know commercials or like the the form of the worldview that is given to us from uh, you know your credit score and the Burger King commercial that you are that is thrust upon you daily. Um, I think yeah so I'm like a humanities academic, right? So of course, like I'm just always looking for new ways to like critique stuff, especially capitalism. That's like you know, that's just my that's that's how I make my money. Um, but that's not the only role faith might have. And this is actually I do do sincerely mean this as a question. I really liked Richard said uh, when introducing my uh, or when uh, I guess doing an ad for, for this forum earlier uh, that uh, like. Faith offers like opportunities for like play and creativity. Um, I think that's a really beautiful, also another example that I hadn't really thought of. So I'd be curious to know what role uh, people see for your faith in this, this or misenchanted world. Surely you've come across this before, even if not in these kind of like Marxist terms. Perhaps you've encountered before uh, this feeling of, you know, okay, well, like the world at large is very secular, very, you know, without, without dominant forms of meaning making that really make you feel good, <laughs> you know? Um, and I'm curious how your own faith practice exists as a response to that at all. Um, that is the end of, of my speaking portion. Of course, I'll, I'll talk back to you. But um, yeah, just be curious to know what you all think. Well, thank you for their, this very enchanting lecture. <laughs> I mean, I'm reminded of um, John Donne's poem. I mean, unless you, you know, ravish me, I'll never be chased. Essentially, you've got to be, you know, totally in love with God, or you're going to get pulled off by. You're going to be seduced by the other. You know, we only have a need for transcendence, and if it's not there, we're going to look for it in other places. Yeah. And I think, it, uh, I mean, the, the story of I think it's Hosea, isn't it? Who his wife cheated on him. I mean, the whole example was, you know, you've got to be, you know, loyal to me, or you're going to you know, be unfaithful. Um, and I and I'm remembering of the story of the, I mean, this is a scientist's point of view, which is can be critiqued. <laughs> um, you know, the Hopi Indian goes out to to worship the sun every morning, and the scientist says, well, you know, 
why don't you just do an experiment and not get up and see if the sun still rises? And the Indian, the Indian said, what? And plunge the world into darkness for the sake of some stupid experiment? <laughs> you know, but it's actually important to get up and see the sun. That's good for your physiology, frankly. You know, it resets all your other circadian rhythms. Yeah. So I think, you know, we, we all need a sense of transcendence, and if it's not with God, it's going to get pulled off into something adapt, unadapted. You know, it can be music in the, the context of a, a church, but uh, it can have other um, manifestations or nature, but yeah, if it's not centered in God, it can, I think. I had a, someone who was telling me how wonderful the Republican convention was because of all the balloons. <laughs> 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 and my grandchildren <laughs> sitting here. I really like what you said. Actually, yeah, that's something uh, Charles Taylor talks a lot about is the uh, eminence and transcendence. And I think, yeah, like the way that I've come to understand it is like we kind of just have like a faculty for, like the same way, like we need to eat, right? Like that's just like something that we have. We like seek connection with others. We seek physical intimacy. And we also seek a sense of transcendence. And that, you're right, that's going to come out one way or another, like whether, you know, in, in some fashion. And I think it's be better to be conscious about it and, and devoted in it rather than just kind of the weird stuff that happens when people try to deny that. Uh, thanks very much. I really enjoyed this. And I, I'm doing research along these lines with Episcopalians in the whole question of um, where is the in I think the elephant in the room here that, that you talk about, kind of talk around it, that I'm interested in is the distinction between progressive and liberal Christianity and evangelical. And like you couldn't do this, even though it's labeled a Christian presentation, you couldn't do this presentation at a Southern Baptist church. I mean, they just wouldn't get it, you know, even though it's coming from a Christian context. So I think the real distinction here is progressive Christianity versus evangelical or fundamentalist. And I often wonder, because it appears they're the ones who are succeeding, you know, we wouldn't have the abortion dilemma that we have. It seems to me if progressive Christianity was able to offer a theological reason on why there should be reproductive freedom, and even though they do in this setting, they don't do it effectively or successfully enough politically. And I think that has to do with progressive Christianity and liberal Christianity has very little daylight between its worldview and a secular worldview. That's right. And that, that kind of works against it in a political setting, because in evangelical Christianity, there's a huge gap that they are trying to fill with what you would consider, and, um, you know, uh, sort of mythological, supernatural stuff yeah. that for their purposes works. Yes. And I wonder why there isn't, there really isn't a progressive liberal response to that. There's a secular response that progressives buy onto. Yeah. But it hasn't really been theologically colored. Yeah. And, you know, maybe you could help that in your work, you know, because I think today you're offering us theological content to the secular worldview. Yes. Something like that. I like what you said that there's very little daylight between, because it's right. Like, I feel like, you know, it's kind of like a, a joke that, like, Episcopalians, like, basically just don't believe in anything. You know, like, that's sort of like the, that is the received. Um, and yeah, I think a lot of like people in a lot of progressive Christians, when asked to provide like justification for a pro-choice stance, right, are just gonna give the same ones that like a secular person would give, right? Exactly. It's gonna be the same thing. Yeah. yeah, I think about that a lot. Um, I do. I kind of admire sometimes like Baptists and fundamentalists and that stuff for their like zeal and their like you know sort of like wholehearted commitment to just being like, nope, like this, you know, that's not what my Savior teaches. You know, you're just going really hard on that kind of. Thing, but of course, you know, off to ill ends. But um, yeah, I don't know. I'm still thinking. I think about this a lot. Yeah. I have two. A couple of comments about the misenchantment of mammon. I remember about 20 years ago in the Christian century, there was a priest of the Church of England who was excoriating Disney. <laughs> because they had, he thought, perverted the whole pilgrimage idea. You know, so they offered the, like this prepackaged experience 
of reality. <laughs> But it had overturned, you know, Campostella and all the pilgrimage sites of Western Europe. I thought that was really interesting, you know. Um, the other thing, um, early in, um, when I was getting a master's at San Diego State, I had a course called the Modern Middle Ages, the history course. And we looked at how in the 19th and 20th century, all this stuff from the Middle Ages reappeared. Um, stained glass windows. Gothic architecture, labyrinths, which appeared in the 20th century, you know, like we have out here. Well, I wrote a paper about that. Um, Lord of the Rings, right? Game of Thrones, Vikings. I mean, all this stuff got extremely popular in the 20th century, as if we're trying to rediscover this worldview or this experience from, you know, five or 600 years ago. I just think that's really interesting. And the third thing I'd say, we're always in conflict with our culture, you know, wherever you are. Yeah. You know, and I'll, I feel this all the time. I'm a Presbyterian and we're, we're, we're blamed for capitalism all the time, you know. Which <laughs> 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 is ridiculous. I mean, Calvin, you know, really took after the, uh, the landlords of Geneva. There were all these, you know, Protestant um, pilgrims coming to Geneva, refugees you know, fleeing Catholic persecution coming there into Geneva, and those SOBs raised the rent. And Calvin really went after them, you know, and he would, you know. Calvinists versus Calvinists. <laughs> <Yeah. laughs> so, um, you know, one way I negotiate this, um, the Ignatian spiritual exercise have helped me a lot. And the Jesuits always remind us, everything is a gift. And, all the stuff that you get in this world, especially money, it's not really yours. You have to, you know, use it for God's glory. And that kind of helps me yeah. not to value my worth on how much money I have and all that stuff. But it's really difficult to do. Yeah. It is really difficult to do. Thank you for that, by the way. I just wanted to commend you on what I see as creative ambiguity in your last question there. What role do you see for your faith in a mischievous world? That can be interpreted as how do you protect and maintain your faith in this world? It also could be interpreted as what role do you see in taking your faith out into the world? And yes. So I'd like to see what people have to say about that. Well, yeah, I don't know. I'm confused on both of those. I mean, like, for my own, like, I, I have focused very much over the past, like, three years on the first part of the ambiguity that you need, right? Where it's like, how do I see my own desire, for, like, how do I structure my own desire for transcendence in a, in a secular world? Like, how do, how do I do that? Like, how do I see my faith practice as part of that, right? But I really, the second question has begun to, you know, start to, you know, rattle around in my head too, because um, I know, you know, like, and even even for Episcopalians, evangelism is still part of the religion, um, and I do think it's important to like bring, bring this like better version of love, this like, just the the final version of love, like to people, um, you know, who might be misenchanted otherwise. But I, you know, I don't know how to do that any, <laughs> very very well, uh, other than talking with friends about it and stuff. I brought a few to church. Well, thank you. Cool. Turn it on. Yeah. So the one that... Okay. Green light. Green light is always a good sign. Um, I appreciate your sharing this question because it makes me see my faith in a way that I don't think I was seeing it before. Um, it's really hard to kind of gather my thoughts. I wish I had a piece of paper and a pencil and I could write them all down and edit them um, uh, since I don't. Um, I think that I see my faith always in action. Um, so when you talk about looking at reimagining re uh, enchantment in the world, I think of what creation is for us. First of all, it's something that's really important. God has brought us into this universe with all the beauty that it shares. Um, and how to um, 
take that and ask people to look a little bit further, to walk, to be in creation, um, so that we can protect it. I'm going to sound like a broken record because that's what I do. <laughs> um, but I think that if we feel the enchantment of creation, we might actually do more about it. So those things that uh, overwhelm us in capitalism, you know, oil extraction, uh, pollution, those other things that we say we're concerned about, we might actually take some action. Yeah. Um, I agree. Also, since I've, I've I have participated in several environmentalist spaces over the years, um, and you know, there are, there are all those people very often clearly yearning for some sort of, like, it goes beyond like a clear, like, okay, this is just like a sort of resource management problem and like, a, you know, equitability problem in this sort of pragmatic sense, like, there's a kind of like spiritual experience that comes with a lot of people's engagement in like environmental causes. Yeah, I wish I could be like, hey, you know what? <laughs> what if you were Christian also? But because there's clearly like a yearning for it, right? Because the again, like the the basic like miss or disenchanted worldview is just the extractive capitalism that's got us into this mess. And of course, burying your head in the sand, going back to like a fully, you know, like like our sort of imagined fundamentalist person might do, they're just going to deny that global warming's happening. Excuse me, I missed probably a minute of Barbara, <laughs> so if, if um, I'm repeating, excuse me. Um, but I thought the, a really important thing was towards the end what you were talking about. Um, so I think our faith um, is, is important, and our faith is important about um, the value of every human life, yeah. that capitalism is failing, and I, um, in terms of devaluing people who haven't made it or whatever. Um, but also I think this is important right now because of the, the whole MAGA thing and the appeal to, to disenchanted people and you know it's all being funneled through through the capitalism that is like yeah. it failed them but it still held up. Yeah. Yeah. So I know. Deep irony. Well, I'm just reminded that the word enthusiasm comes from entheos, the god within. So if we each have our, what's that little song, my, my little light's going to shine, or something like that. <laughs> yeah, so we each use our God-given talents, and I think people see that enthusiasm. Yeah. And I have to give credit, I don't know if anybody has seen this view of reality that Mary Augustine put on at the old global. Richard, if you haven't seen it, you've got to see it. This is, he takes dance and gymnastics and applies it to the story of Romeo and Juliet and walk <laughs> in. <laughs> you didn't see it? I right? yeah. think that was, yeah. yeah, I mean, perfect talent. And then to add on to kind of, he, when you walk in, you're either given a, a red band or a blue band, you know, but, and it's based on the story of Romeo and Juliet. And, you know, you're, you're a Capulet, you get a blue band, and, you know, you get a red band if you're uh, Romeo's fan. But when um, Juliet's relative dies, she goes around and takes off all the red and blue for everybody. And so the audience is so enchanted, or at least the audience, yeah. that they, they just take off their bands and throw them. <laughs> we're like, we're not going to get into this. You know? And it, I thought it was really moving. I mean, it was a way to bring different people together. And so, I mean, that was his gift. I mean, they're not very talented. Felt, but I just thought that's an example of using transcendent experience. Yeah, that's that's cool. I mean, like, that's, I love ritual for that reason. Like that's you know that's what brought me to the Episcopal Church too. Is like I knew I knew that I was like okay, I need I need the ritual part. Of, like there just needs to be that that to your body's got to be involved, you know, to really have it be such an enchanting experience. So. Marcia Heliade writes a lot about the access mundi, the, the space between worlds. Um, and most, it's interesting because he was writing against Nazism and creating whole sale new religions out of nothing, essentially. But the way that I've seen it applied in my life, um, 
is in a lot of different spaces, but the place that it's taking me to today is on the lake that my parents live on up in uh, northern Wisconsin. There's a lily pad ring, like a fairy ring, out in the middle of the lake. And one time, my sister, uh, my wife Maura, and I took a robe out, out and just sat in it for a little bit, just for grins. But the most magical things happened afterwards. A blue heron like buzzed us. We watched kingfishers going crazy, buzzing each other, and then more blue herons buzzing each other, and then there was this eagle at the end watching all of us, like, you idiots in a boat. Like, this has always been here. <laughs> but regardless, whether you, know, whether you think that fairy rings are real and contain some sort of magic, or if just noticing it, and putting ourselves in it in a place where we could be more receptive to the wider creation. That for me typifies, it doesn't really matter whether it's from the faith view or from a scientific view, either way, you can come to a place where you're more receptive to the signs and the symbols of the world around you. And I think for me, that's what my faith does is that it just opens me up more to see the actual magic that's going on, regardless of whether I think it's magical or not. Right. Yeah, I think that's that is beautiful. I guess I like I, I don't know why my my mind does this, but I will be like, ah, oh, but if I think about like what the science of it is, it's cool. It's like fascinating. Mm -hmm. It's so interesting. You know, whoa, like the algae's growing in that pattern. Mm -hmm. like, I forget how fairy rings happen. Yeah. But like, uh, but then I go, oh. Well, <laughs> All right, you know, <laughs> was, uh, okay, well, that kind of exhausted the whole thing then, you know. And it, like, so it is hard to like exist in like that sort of uh, uh, tension between the knowledge of the fact of the matter and then the desire to maintain a, a sort of like mindful sense of transcendence in, in that moment. But like, but yeah, that's, that's got to be it. So, like, <laughs> yeah. Because at the end of the day, I don't believe in fairies and I do believe in algae or whatever the case may be. And so I have to. Yeah. I have to find it there. Yeah. Yeah. Two two things on uh, wearing the NCIS hat. How many people see NCIS at all at uh, TV? Yeah. One or two. Okay. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. In hotel rooms. Yeah. yeah. Well, it's it's yeah. a yeah. yeah it's a <laughs> Naval Inc. Criminal Investigation Service. And of course, there's a lot of gunplay and trying to figure out who the bad guy is. But the real essence of the of the play, and this has been going on for 20 years. Uh, are the relationships not only between the people who are on the team uh, to try to find the bad guy and uh, prosecute him, uh, is uh, also those who they involve. And so reconciliation is the, is the main word, and new life, always, in every episode, and uh, usually brings tears to my eyes. So I think that, uh, I think of the word ev evocative, it's really the word there that people get caught up in that. And uh, a fellow who runs a uh, convenience store down the, down the way from our house uh, is usually just simply joking around and kind of making light of things. But he saw uh, Dion uh, on the Olympics and her story and how he was <coughs> enchanted with that. Something beyond the rational, something beyond the capitalism, etc. Uh, another thing, if I may continue on, I'm uh, rereading for the about the umpteenth time uh, the uh, a book by Frederick Beekman and uh, about truth, and he sees the gospel as tragedy, comedy, and fairy tale, so that we find God in the absence of God when we get down to the depths and we feel despair. We find God in the comedy of surprises in life, Abraham and Sarah, and finally uh, in fairy tale, uh, the, whole, the whole myth of the Christian um, proclamation is a fairy tale which turns out to be true. So that's my contribution this morning. Thanks. Thank you for that. I like to tie into on stories too. Hi everyone, um, this is my first time here and thank you all for the warm welcome. Uh, I actually am of a different faith 
um, I'm Buddhist, and I think that we should all work together to find good solutions for this because um, my my practice has a lot in common um, with, with this, and the service is so beautiful today. But uh, two things that are really important for my practice that help me to really orient myself um, in the world and in society and also to combat uh, the pressures of capitalism are um, this idea of like renunciation, which I think a lot of people probably are familiar with when they think of Buddhism. Um, and sometimes it's understood as kind of a, a need for scarcity or to give up the things that you you may like, which is not actually what this idea of renunciation is in practice, but um, looking towards the fact that the things that we really need that really bring us happiness and, uh, and peace are only found within ourselves, mostly found within ourselves, and um, that there is an invitation to give up our attachments to the things that really distract us from that. And I think that that helps me combat um, what capitalism presents, which is that like by acquiring things, um, more money, more more space, more um, even like a better job, all of these things uh, which take us away from the fact that you can find some sort of peace and self-acceptance just within yourself in the, in the present moment. Um, really helps so that way I don't have this constant uh, yearning for something that I don't have. Um, and so I think that's been a, a good tool to combat what capitalism presents, which is that you need to buy things and you need to look outside yourself for other things. Um, and then also in my tradition of Buddhism, there's a big emphasis on this concept of interbeing, which is that it's impossible to be by yourself, um, that we rely so much on others, on the environment, um, on connection, and in ways that we will never even understand, like even the conditions that have led me to be here. Uh, I have to be grateful for, for doctors, for my parents, for for the food I'm able to eat that gives me energy to be here, and for so many people and beings that I'll never even be able to know. Um, and I think that that has been really important to me to see connection with other people that I may not initially have something in common with. And I think that that's been really important to me also to not feel so uh, individualistic. And I think that that, for me, is how I'm trying to find a solution forward a lot of problems that we have, which bring about a lot of division. Yeah, so those are two things that I think that we to Thanks, Ashley. Yeah, I do think, I think a lot of different, there, there's clearly like responses to this that exist in different traditions. I, I want to know more about Islam. Like I, I was thinking about it the other day, and I'm like, I know so embarrassing and about like really what goes on in Islam, but I, I want to know like, well, okay, what are, what are they doing with this kind of stuff? I'm sure they got something going on. Um, so thank you for the Buddhist perspective too. That's also quite helpful. Um, yeah, is there any, I think we're nearly to time. Yeah, quite. So I think that's a very good point, and I, I remember Scott Richard, a former dean, was really trying to integrate Buddhism and Christianity. Um, and of course, being a C.S. Lewis fan, I have to, you know, quote him how the importance of fairy tales. You know, yeah. If you're, you're going to take something away from somebody, you got to give something to them. So if you're going to take something away on the horizontal plane, you got to give them something on the, the vertical plane. And um, I think C.S. Lewis is reading a, you know, came across one of uh, George MacDonald's books, fan, fan, fantastic. In a train station, and that just sort of baptized his imagination. And it just, um, speaking as a role of fairy tales and imagination, I just remember it's very humbling. I was working with a veteran who had been deployed many, many times and had a lot of depression and demoralization. And uh, I was trying to, you know, I gave her all the best psychopharmacology that I could, and she just wasn't budging. And then one day she came in and she just looked great. I said, geez, you look so much better. Said, what is that? She said, oh, I just finished here. Huh? 
What is it about Harry Potter that <laughs> she feels so much better? She said it's magic. So this whole idea, I think, of magic and the transcendent. Yeah, yeah, we, yeah. I think, you know, God is magic, essentially. Um, I think we lose sight of that. Thank you. That's a great one to end on. I think, especially Comic Con Sunday. <laughs> <laughs> Thanks so much, everybody. It's uh, always, always a joy and a pleasure to do this.